So what's this? To one more team in the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. And lastly, we go over who's passing, who's failing in the first semester of the MLB season. I am your host, Matthew Raritan, and this is Total Sports Talk Beyond the Lights. What's going on, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Total Sports Talk Beyond the Lights. I am live once again from the hospital. Hope you uh, don't mind my sports decorations I've got here. You know, uh, go Steelers, but uh, at least I got something here. But uh, I'm just really glad that I could be here and uh, glad I could be here with these fellas here. And we've got ourselves a great show to go over today. I want to go ahead and introduce first both of my co-hosts here today. First, we've got David Street. What's up, everybody? And secondly, we've got Ed Smith. Welcome, y'all. Yeah, the NBA playoffs continued last night. And as I mentioned in my intro, we had an unsung hero really take over in this game with the Philadelphia 76ers and the New York Knicks. And no, it was not Joel Embiid for the Sixers. It was Tyrese Maxey who really took over for this team, put, him, put the team on his back essentially to help propel the 76ers to an overtime victory over the Knicks uh, where they won 112 to 106. But before we talk about Tyrese Maxey, I actually want to talk about Jalen Brunson, guys. I want to tell you that I was probably the biggest Jalen Brunson critic there was. I didn't think he was all that. He was getting all this hype and I thought it was just smoke. But I'm going to be the first to tell you right now that it was not smoke. It was well-deserved because Jalen Brunson, what he's doing with the Knicks is very special. They have a bright future ahead of them as long as he is pretty much their captain. Uh, the season's not over for them. They could still win this series as they are still up 3-2. to two. But Jalen Brunson, just watching him every pretty much every game, especially the game that he had before this last game where – uh, Joel Embiid scored 50 points the game before, and then he came back and really just took over for the Knicks. And now here he is again with another 40-point uh, game or so where he's just really dominating these playoffs. And I really want to you know, tip my cap to him because Jalen Brunson is the real deal, and I'm going to stand by that now, even though I was a critic before. So uh, shout-out to Jalen Brunson, all he's doing for the Knicks. Uh, but Tyrese Maxey, that's who we're going to talk about here with a 46-point game. And like I said, he put the team on his back. This was like the infamous Marshawn Lynch clip. I put the team on my back. Um, and... That's exactly what he did with his heroics, as you could call it, at the end of the game, going before overtime with the four-point play he had, which, uh, spoiler alert, NBA just came out and said that uh, they missed a travel on that play. So that was a – that's a big swing right there. The fact that it should have been a travel according to the NBA, but it wasn't. And he got that four-point play, which brought them right back into the game. So – uh, that was really big right there. It was clutch as can be. Uh, I mean, how are you guys feeling about Tyrese Maxey and his performance? In big moments like that, you got to step up. Absolutely, you do. And I'm going to talk about one more player later on about who stepped up in a big moment, especially when their star player is down by injury. But uh, Joel Embiid, who although he's been hurt majority of his career and majority of this season, uh, it can't always be him. You have to have another guy. And last night, well, who was that other guy? It was Tyrese Maxey. So this 46 point game couldn't come at a better time because the Knicks could have easily finished out this series last night uh, in the garden at home. And Tyrese Maxey had other plans. Yeah. Maxey was the star and Bede was the second Whereas usually it's the other way around. And considering how much effort, how much energy that Maxi had on the floor versus what Embiid was providing, because he's on half a knee and, you know, on painkillers for a migraine headache, 
<clears throat> it, they needed that. They also needed some help from the Knicks, which uh, there were some things there that, you know, the Knicks could have closed them out, but they didn't. And kudos for the 76ers and, you know, Tyrese Maxey especially, since he was the majority of the offense uh, as, as of the start of the fourth quarter. Kudos to them for uh, overcoming it and moving the game – moving the series back into uh, Philly. Yeah. Tyrese Maxey, he's no uh, Reggie Miller or ben, or uh, Tracy McGrady, but he had seven points in the matter of, what was it, 17 seconds. So, I mean, he really uh, put the team on his back and was impressive at the very end, and that's when you need someone to step up the most. Uh, but yeah, I want to ask the question: Really, did the 76ers win, or did the Knicks lose it? Because the you know there were two five plus point comebacks, and that being one of them, they were down by six. The Sixers that be uh, before that four point play that really brought them back into it. But the free throw game, guys. Josh Hart missed a crucial free throw at the end, and uh, don't get me wrong, the the Sixers did as well. Joel Embiid had missed one, but it, when it mattered the most. And the Knicks, where they needed those free throws, they missed them. And that's what kept the Sixers in the game. And like I said, that four-point play really helped them uh, just itch back just close enough where they eventually did tie the game to go to overtime. So uh, who won it? Did the 76ers win it or did the Knicks lose it? Uh, Maybe a little bit of both or maybe it was just uh, um, Maxie just really put the team on his back. So what do you guys think? I'm going to say I think it was more so that the Knicks lost it because, like, when you're in that situation, it's almost like you're you're trying to lose, you know? Yeah, but uh, Jalen Brunson was hitting big-time shots at the end. So he was doing his part, but it was more the Knicks as a whole were not. Yeah. So he did what he needed to do, but the rest of the team did not. I'm going to say it's a little bit of both because how do you wind up in overtime? It's a tie game. That means there is no point differential whatsoever. So <clears throat> if the Knicks hit just one more free throw, just one, then we're not talking about an overtime. And the two five-point comebacks that, that the 76ers had – were one in the fourth quarter and one in overtime. So they overcame deficits in both time uh, time periods. So they, I would say that they really won it. But in the end, the Knicks let it happen. They opened the door for it to happen. So that's why I'm thinking it's kind of both ways on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really, Ed, I really like your uh, Booger McFarlane uh uh, impression right there. Yeah, both teams, they uh, they scored the same <laughs> amount as the other team. Therefore, it resulted in an overtime. And, and, and that's not a dig at you, Ed, but that's literally what Booger McFarlane would probably say. My that's hands obvious. aren't as messed up as Booger McFarlane's. That's, that is, that is. that's the difference. <laughs> well, I also want to kind of talk to you about, you know, we're, we're talking about players that have, that have stepped up. I mean, I hate to uh, – I hate to uh, put anybody in, in a bad light, but I think we also need to talk about uh, New York's Dante DiVincenzo just totally re- regressing in, in the playoffs. In the regular season, he averaged a very respectable 15 points per game on like 44 45% shooting. Well, his numbers have gone down drastically. Now he's averaging about 10 points per game on about 33% shooting. And listen, I'm not – you know, I'm not saying that everything is his fault. And at the end of the day, the Knicks are so up in the series. But he's also one of uh, New York's starters. And certainly his uh, play as of late hasn't, uh, you know, hasn't hasn't helped his team. And maybe if his play hasn't regressed, then maybe New York would, would already uh, clinch the series by now. But his, uh, but his re- regression has been very, uh, very worrying to say the least. I'm really glad you brought him up because that's that's pretty much who I was going to talk about next. Uh, having come in over from Golden State and being among the likes of Clay Thompson, Steph Curry, uh, he kind of brought that over as well. But if you saw a stat line last night, nine points and his only three field goals were 
three point shots. And it's like, he's trying to recreate that splash brother situation over in New York. And it's like, you have to be more than just that. And it's like, that's all he knows how to do right now. And he's been on a cold streak. I mean, only three field goals resulting in nine points, all being three point shots. It's like, you have to do more than that if you really want to contribute. Yeah. And uh, I've definitely seen a fall off for him. Let me ask you all this. With the way the 76ers came back last night, does that put the pressure more on the Knicks than the 76ers at this point to go ahead and win back in Philly before having to push it to a game seven? Because if the Sixers win in Philly and it goes to a game seven, all the momentum is on that side of the on that side of the bench. So is that creating a situation where the Knicks are feeling the the constraint of pressure that the 76ers just aren't at this point? I'll, I'll let you take it, David. I, I think I would say the pressure is still on the Knicks right now because well, first of all, um, the Knicks they they did take a three one series lead, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So I would say the pressure is on the Knicks right now because, you know, you're up, you're up three, one and well now, now you're only, now you're only up three, two. And so that pressure is kind of mounting that pressure is there. Like, well, we don't want to give all the steam, the, the momentum because if they win one, one more game, then yeah, all the momentum is going to be on their, on their side right now. I think, you know, um, they are, they've been the better team all, all season. They are the better team in, in the postseason right now. And so certainly the pressure is on them to be the better team and to close out like they are the better team. Yeah, I, I agree with David. Um, and I'll take it a little step further is yes, all the pressure is on New York right now. Uh, hypothetically, uh, the only way that the pressure would be on the Sixers is let's say, it was Embiid last night who was the hero again with 50 points. That's where it put a little pressure on them because you have your one-star player that's constantly putting the team on his back while injured. It would put a little bit of pressure on the Sixers to do that, but since you had someone different, kind of takes that pressure off, and now it's like, all right, well, we were down 3-1. It all it takes is one game at a time. We just won in the garden. Let's go back home and win and then go back to the garden. And the last thing you want to do is lose on your home turf. And the Knicks are going to have all the pressure facing towards them. And it's New York. We talked about big market teams like with LeBron James. Well, New York is a big market and you can't let that happen. The Spike Lees that are there, uh, Ben Stillers, all these people that were there, they – that's what's made New York such a big market that if you lose game seven at home in New York, there, there there's no coming back from that really. So the pressure is going to be on New York the rest of this series. <clears throat> but uh, there was another great game that happened last night, came down to the very end. It did not go into overtime, but this is coming a very, very entertaining series. And that's Cleveland Cavaliers and the Orlando Magic. Cleveland jumped out to a 2-0 start in this series. Like, it was easy. It was easy money. Well, Orlando said, we're better than this. We've got a lot of young talent here that w- we deserve to really be back in this. They won the next two. Uh, last night, though, they did lose right at the end when Evan Mobley blocked Franz Wagner's layup shot right at the end to go for the tie. But this was such an entertaining game because the fact that Orlando was able to bounce right back into this game towards the end and really show that although they're young, they deserve to be there. And David's been talking about it for a while now, this Magic team and really what they're uh, just proving. They're proving it in the playoffs right now. And and even if they lose, I think they've proven enough to really show their worth and that they can be there for the next several years. I mean, David, them being your team, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you also said it yourself. I mean, you know, we got punk the first two games – um, and we looked really bad. We looked really bad on the road. And Jalen Jalen Suggs himself admitted um, that being in that um, tough uh, road crowd environment uh, definitely took uh, took a toll on him. He said that he would always kind of just look or, look around the crowd. Now, you know, keep in mind this this is his first uh, NBA playoff series, and it's the first uh, playoff series for a lot of these Magic players because you know because uh, we are such a uh, we are such a young team. Um, but 
but also um, it's also helped us grow because obviously we looked so much better on the road uh, last night, you know, and when we almost had them. And then kudos to Evan Mobley for that phenomenal walk on uh, on Franz Wagner. Um, but also uh, the playoffs is where superstars step up. And I cannot say enough good things about Paolo Boncaro. I mean, he's just – he's completely stepped his game up uh, in these uh, five games in the playoffs so far. And if you look at his numbers, if you take away that one game where he had just nine points, just take away that game – He's averaging about 29 points per game on about 52% shooting. Uh, are there still some parts of his game that he could uh, shine up, that um, that he could tweak up, that could be a little better? Yeah, absolutely. But think about this, okay? He's 21 years old and in a second season, and he are already led Orlando to its best season in over a decade. Like, this kid is a superstar, and the sky is the limit with him. Oh, absolutely. Being in your second season and doing what he's doing uh, is impressive. Not a lot of people could say being in their second season that they're able to accomplish what he's already accomplishing in that city. But let's not forget about this team who has Paulo, who has Jalen Suggs, Cole Anthony, and of course, Franz Wagner. They've all really stepped up in their own way. And that's why I really mm-hmm. liked Orlando's chances it, just in the future. But uh, And then at, we're just one more thing I want to add. Like, you know, you mentioned, uh, well, we, we, we both mentioned Jalen Jalen Suggs and Matthew keep in mind that it was pretty much last year or before this year that Suggs was starting to become like label, labeled as as a bust because he was the fifth overall pick if I remember correctly he was a top five pick I, I, I remember that at least and just things didn't seem to be working out well he's gone from being nearly labeled a bust to being our best defender, not name, not named Jonathan Isaac. So, really, yeah. really proud of him. Yeah, and Ed, I, I want you to talk about this maybe a little bit more. But ever since he made the move from Salt Lake City, do you feel maybe Donovan Mitchell isn't getting talked about enough, or maybe the credit he deserves because of all the things he did in Salt Lake City, but always fell short? Uh, is this still the same Donovan Mitchell that we're seeing? I mean, he put up twenty eight points last night. Well, he's definitely a guy that people are going to have eyes on at all times because he's Donovan Mitchell. He's a guy that they went out and pursued to get into this lineup. Now, though, the thing that I, I really find between these two teams is they are at a level in which they cannot play their B minus game and beat who they're playing. They they have to be on all cylinders and that's for both of these teams that's why we're we're in a three two setup by ha- by a block shot you know that is that's what I'm seeing out of this series is you get the Cavs get a run the magic get a run it's kind of back and forth and we're talking over a game and then uh, you know within the game itself you know you know what I'm talking about but the <laughs> the idea that these teams could just roll the ball out there and expect to win. That's not how these teams are at this point. Cleveland is certainly not at a level that you're going to see New York or uh, the 76ers. They're, they're seated higher than the 76ers, but we all know why that is. But between those two, between those two teams, it's, it's really a, who's going to show up. Who's going to show up as a team? Who's going to kind of fall apart when the chips are down? And that's really what we're seeing between these teams in this series. Well, the other thing too, and we really cannot talk about this. uh, We we cannot talk about this game without mentioning the elephant in the room. And that was the Cavs were without Jared Allen. And, you know, we had a, we, uh, we had an advantage there. Um, and we just uh, and we completely blew it. But you know, kudos to uh, Evan Mobley for what he did for his 14-13 uh, performance, and then obviously the the uh, block he had. Um, but also his defense, particularly on uh, on uh, uh, on Paolo, has been really really rock solid. Uh, shout out to uh, Kendrick Perkins um, for the stat. But apparently, when Paolo is being guarded by uh, Mobley, he's shooting just around thirty percent. 
but against every other Cavs player, he's shooting like 56, 57 percent, something like that. So when he's being guarded by Evan Evan Mobley, he's breaking it. But every other Cavs player, he's shooting at a pretty high percentage. Ed, David, I want to ask you this really quick before we head on to the next series. Uh, were you surprised at all that the ball was in Franz Wagner's hands, the last play of the game, essentially, for the Magic? Uh, do you support that, or was it based off of your stat you just talked about, why it was in his hands? I mean, I think certainly it was surprising because – I'm a simple guy and you know, I'm under the impression that whoever your best player is that game, he probably should have the ball in his hands at, at the last second. So I don't understand why Powell didn't have the ball there, but you know, it is, it is what it is at this point. Nothing, nothing we can yeah. do now. Yeah. It's all water on the bridge. I mean, he did have the ball and you could see where uh, Wagner said, Nope. Give it to me. <laughs> and he did. And, and that might have been because of Mobley. I, but yeah. in, the, in Mobley is the one who ended up blocking the shot. So well, I don't want to take too much credit away from, from, from Mobley, right? Yeah. Because, no. he, you know, he, he made a hell of a, hell of a block there, you know? Absolutely. And just all you got to do is tip your cap. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was an incredible block. And, and players can step up on defense, too, just like we talked about with uh, Tyrese Maxey showing up when it meant the most on offense. Well, showing up on defense when it means the most is just as incredible. And that block was phenomenal. So, uh, you know, uh, shout out to him. But uh, I talked about this actually before the show. I was talking with David and I was like, gosh, this series is just drunk. Like, it's just drunkenness, and it's true. <laughs> and that is none other than the Milwaukee Bucks and the oh, Indiana dear. Pacers. It's like, uh, it's like you got your drunk goggles on. Like, who the heck's going to show up? And I was really shocked with the stat line last night when I looked at it with the Pacers because it, all their starters, it, none of them were, you know, in the 20s. And I'm not saying that that's horrible, but when you've seen this team in the playoffs right now, it's not what you would have expected. And then you have a wounded buck. You had, you know, one that was just pretty much shot with an arrow that's wounded. And uh, without Damian Lillard, without Giannis, and what do they do? Well, they pretty much dominate this entire game. I mean, uh, that third quarter, the Pacers really just decided to not show up. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe they got a little full at halftime with whatever food they ate, but they did not show up in the third quarter. And that was pretty much the stamp right there because from that point on, they were trying to play catch up and it was just too late. But the Bucks, without their two stars, uh, that's okay because Chris Middleton's been there since the beginning. And he's 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 their true buck because uh, just the game before he made a shot a three an incredible three point shot to force overtime against the Pacers it was amazing uh, and here he is in this game also leading the way for the Bucks but I don't know who the heck's gonna show up in these games we talked about how Cleveland and Orlando you have to be at pretty much at your A plus otherwise you're not gonna win well. Last night, you could pretty much be at your C game and you would have won. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I have a, yeah. Well, I have a couple things that I want to say. Uh, you know, first off, um, I give Doc Rivers a ton of hell, you know, all, all the time, but I got to give him his flowers. I got to give him, I got to give credit where credit is, is due. And he, de he deserves a ton of credit for that win, especially without their uh, top two scorers. And then I have a bit of a hot take here, but I actually think that the Bucks' domination of, of the Pacers, you know, doing it without their uh, their uh, two top scorers, I actually think that could potentially spell disaster for the Bucks. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, think about it. The Indiana Pacers just got punked by a team that was, that was without its top two scorers. Well, now the Pacers are going back home to Indianapolis. Think about how embarrassed they are, the manner in which they lost. And now they're going to be playing in front of their fans. All they need is just one more win to clinch the series. And they have some extra motivation. Like, I'm telling you, that loss, the way that they lost, the way that they lost is going to fuel them. It's going to fuel the, the heck out of them. And I would not be surprised if they ran the Bucks out of the gym in the, in the next game. I'm going to rebuttal your hot take with my own hot take. And that is Damian Lillard is coming back. Uh, I think he uh, controls this. And the reason why I say that is because Damian Lillard is known for one thing for the most part, and that is being probably one of the best first-round players there is. Uh, he shows up in the first round, 
and he usually puts his stamp on things, and I see him doing that again if he comes back. Uh, because it, it, it's it's Dame time, as cringe as that may sound. That is essentially what it is for him. This is when he thrives the most. I mean, let's not forget what he did against OKC uh, when he was with the, the Blazers, and he did that. It hurt as well. So uh, if he could come back and at least be able to put up, you know, uh, close to 40 minutes, I think that uh, he's going to be able to actually win these games for them. But uh, we'll, we'll see. Ed? Well, <clears throat> with I have a tough time with this one because this is a series that I have a hard time getting viewership down here on that. So I I really don't have a lot to say about this. I just know there's a point where we give Doc Rivers a ton of crap on this show, but this is a coach that has won more than a hundred games in the playoffs in the NBA. And that's got to be respected at some point. And he's had totally different lineups in each of the stops that he's been at. And with Lillard coming back, they're trying to get Giannis back, but there's who knows at this point. So he knows how to handle this. I will agree with David, though. They got punked in front of their mama. And you you don't get punked in front of your mama and don't come out swinging the next time out. And that's exactly what I what I agree with you, David, is going to happen. Uh, with as badly as they got beat last night, uh, they're going to come out and show, show some testicular fortitude, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got to – I mean, one last thing that I'll add. I don't, I don't remember who I – picked in this series. I don't remember if I picked the Bucks because the Pacers defense is, is just hot trash or if I picked the Pacers because, you know, the, because, because of the Bucks having Doc Rivers as, Absolutely. as their, as their coach. Um, but ultimately I have to say, you know, like kudos to the Pacers. I, uh, clearly their defense has not held them back yet. Not yet, yet. <laughs> exactly yet. Um, I want to transition to another league that's in the midst of their playoffs, and that is the NHL. Stanley Cup playoffs are happening right now, and uh, we had a lot of teams really actually inch back right into it, and then, like I said, we said uh, sayonara to one. And first I want to talk about uh, the Boston Bruins and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Bruins were up 3-1. Well, uh, Maple Leafs won last night. It is now three to two. Uh, they are showing that they still have life, and they're you know then they're doing this without Austin Matthews really being the Austin Matthews we're used to seeing. Why, why is he even? Why is he even out? Do we do we know? Uh, he was out for oh my gosh, I know what it was for too, but um, I can't think of it right now. Gosh, I, I it's on the tip of my tongue, but it's like. This is your star player right here. This is the guy who had the most goals in the NHL, and this is when you need him the most. I mean, look at what Connor McDavid's doing with Edmonton. He's got 10 points in the playoffs right now, which is the most out of everyone in the NHL right now. He's continuing what he did in the regular season into the postseason, and that's assist, 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 but he's still gathering up points. So, I don't really know what's going on with Austin Matthews and the Toronto Maple Leafs, but they are still alive, three to two. But is this more of the Bruins kind of playing with their food, the cat with the mouse uh, here, or do you really think the Maple Leafs are for real and can actually pull off this upset? I, I'm just going to say that I think the the Bruins just lost a little bit of the focus because they realized that Austin Matthews wasn't out there. So when that happens. It, you kind of like, oh, cool. I, I think we got this. No big deal. And, you know, you can get surprised in something like that. You know, kind of takes me back to the Stars Night Steer, uh, Stars and Knights series. You know, the Stars dominated most of the first four games, but they wound up 2 2. I mean, you know, crazy things happen in hockey where you can dominate and still wind up losing the game. That's that's just how weird it is. So I think that may be a good part of it, more so than just you know saying, "Oh, don't worry about it. We've got games to spare." 
Well, until the Leafs actually beat the Bruins in a playoff series, you know, re- recently, yeah. then I can't say that, that the Leafs are for real, at least not yet. But it is also very, well, maybe not very, but it is a little concerning that the Bruins uh, haven't been able to uh, take advantage of the absence of Austin Matthews. But they're still up in the series, so they just need one more win and they're good to go. Yeah, and I think they will. Uh, the pressure has been taken off of them a little bit this year, not you know having the the best record and actually an all time best record. Uh, but they, there's still a little pressure on them because they should be beating the Leafs, mm-hmm. especially yep. without their star player. So uh, I'll be interested to see how that this next game goes. But I want to talk about the Nashville Predators. Are they really surprising you guys in this series? I mean, the Canucks are, are up 3-2, to two, but Nashville is hanging in there. And this Canucks team was the best team at uh, the All-Star break, or they, you know, the, amongst the best teams uh, mm-hmm. at the All-Star break. And Nashville, you know, Nashville's doing their thing. Uh, I mean, are you surprised by, you know, at least of it, David? I mean, any bit well, or what? Well, I mean, the, the Canucks um, have been one of the best t- teams in, uh, in the league from uh, start to finish. But also, the Nashville Predators have been one of the best second-half teams. You, you guys remember there was a point where they had like a, what was it, like an 18, close to a 20-point um, uh, point streak. Um, or, excuse me, yeah, 20-game point streak, 18, yeah. 18 to 20-point 20 uh, 20 streak. Um, so, uh so uh, they're, they've got a lot of momentum that they're, uh, that they're riding on right now. But I will say that I think it's kind of surprising because I had the Canucks beating the Predators in five games. But give credit to the Preds. I think they're definitely fighting their uh, asses off right now. And especially give credit to the Preds for, uh, for winning uh, that, that last game, especially because the manner in which they lost um, before, when they lost, what was it, game four? Yeah, game four was just... Like you're you're this close to hitting the empty net. Okay, you miss it. Well, that's okay. You're still up with a few seconds left. But then the Canucks tie it with a few seconds left, and then they win it and win it in overtime. So you literally go from nearly tying the series. Well, now it's three one, and you're heading back on the road to Van to Vancouver. You're down three one. The odds are stacked against you, and the fact that they were able to pull that off and now they get to go back to Nashville with momentum on their side. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and when you, when you look at the predators, you, you hit the nail on the head, David, uh, being a second half team since February, the predators have really been one of the best teams in the league period. The fact that they gave away game four the way that they did, and they, their backs were against the wall going into the third period in last night's game to turn around and come out with a victory to extend the series going back to Vancouver and hopefully back uh, and hopefully coming back to Nashville and then hopefully back to Vancouver. You know, that is, that is coming together when it matters the most. And that is something that I've, they've been able to do because in February they were not in the race at all. They had just gotten a beat down and then they came together and said, you know what? This is not us. This is not what we do. And then really flipped a switch. And from that, that point on, I, they were, I believe it was almost a half a goal more uh, per game by, and giving up almost a goal less per game since that time, it has been amazing what their transformation was from that point on to know that when the back is, when their backs are against the wall, they do come out swinging and that's what they did last night. And I do expect to see them continue to do so. Yeah. Vancouver, you know, had a really good opportunity to be able to close out at home and they still may get another opportunity to do so if a game seven happens, but uh, Nashville came in there on the road and got a very much needed win. That probably felt amazing for them to bring that back home to their home crowd, their home ice uh, to hopefully force a game seven. So uh, Vancouver is going to be a little ticked off. They didn't get a close out at home, but uh, they still may get another opportunity if it goes to a game seven. 
Um, but talk about a team who's not going to see a game seven. That's the Winnipeg Jets. <laughs> I mean, uh, they, after game one against the Colorado Avalanche, it, w- it looked like it could be anyone's series. This was goal after goal after goal. Uh, and it was pretty much what we expected to see. It was actually pretty fun to watch. And after that, the Avs won four straight. And another in dominating early, fashion too. In dom- yes, in dominating fashion. It's another early exit uh, by the Winnipeg Jets, and it was a big letdown. They, a lot of people had the Jets winning this series, and uh, the Avalanche. They obviously had other plans, and they really made it look easy once after Game One. So, uh, you know, huge kudos to the Avalanche, uh, who you know have won the Stanley Cup here recently, and they want to you know, go back there and win the Stanley Cup, especially when you have a team in the NBA like the Denver Nuggets who are looking pretty darn uh, comfortable possibly going back there again too. So, uh, you know, the city of Denver and the state of Colorado are really looking forward to hopefully having that happen. And if the Avalanche continue to play like they played this series, I don't see why they couldn't do that. And I'm not saying that because I chose the Avalanche to represent the West. But <laughs> it, it was pretty nice seeing this uh, series win when uh, they weren't expected to. So the Avs will play the winner of the Stars and Knights, which is an incredible series on its own. Uh, but uh, I would imagine you guys are also equally impressed with the Avalanche. Well, yeah, I am. But you know who I'm not impressed with? Winnipeg starting goaltender, Con- Connor Hellebuck. I mean, this is a guy who is more than likely going to win the Vesna Trophy. I have his numbers right here, okay? His numbers in the regular season, all right? 2.39 goals against average and a 921 save percentage. In the postseason, 5.23 goals against average, 870 save percentage, all right? Now... Take uh, take a guy, uh, Alexander Gior- uh, Georgiev, I think. Yeah. Um, take Georgiev, who really wasn't that great in the regular season. I mean, he did have a winning he did have a winning record, an impressive winning record. But I think that was more of a testament to how good the skaters are in, in front of him, right? But but you know, uh, you have him against Hellebuck. Who uh, who are you going to put your money on? The guy who's probably going to win the Vezina Trophy, right? Well, you look at you look at Georgiev's numbers, and my apologies if I'm uh, mispronouncing his uh, surname. Um, but they were great in the in the uh, in the postseason. Well, the truth is, if you look at his numbers in the postseason, they are going to say like a three point zero goals against average and a nine hundred save percentage. But a lot of that is because of Game One when he uh, led up seven goals. But since Game One. In games two through five, he has been absolutely rock solid, and he was a huge reason why the Avs were able to uh, gentlemanly sweep the uh, the uh, Jets, as uh, corny as that sound. What did you say? You said Georgia of his, his what name? Uh, I I said that his name is Alexander, right? Alexander Georgia of. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you said something after that about like it being his uh, something name. Sorry. Oh, his uh, his his surname. That's it's, just la- last name. It's Ma'am. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I just I found an opportunity and I wanted to slip that in there. But um, but no, I actually think you have it pronounced right there, Georgiev. Um, but yeah, when you have someone that who is possibly a clear front runner to win the Vesna Trophy, uh, you would expect them to continue that trend in the postseason. Uh, I mean, we saw that with Igor Shostakin just a couple years ago against the Penguins, and it seemed like he was uh, human again. So it, it can happen, uh, but you would hope that uh, they would continue that. Uh, strength into the postseason, and he did not do that whatsoever. I mean, game one was a testament to that from the very get-go, even though they pulled out with the win, but you saw every game after that being uh, totally controlled uh, from the avalanche. But uh, another sayonara to another team, and that is uh, the New York Islanders. Uh, we This was much expected with the Carolina Hurricanes uh, really controlling this one. I was actually surprised the Islanders even won one, but uh, Canes uh, rounded out the series with uh, four games to one. And there's no shocker there, uh, but I, I want to talk more about the Hurricanes, but I want to talk about them in the sense of this all-star matchup between them and the Rangers. Uh, and I also want to kind of compare that to the other all-star matchup we are about to see in the NBA with the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Denver Nuggets. Um, if you're a sports fan, 
these are the two series you want to tune into and watch because uh, the Rangers ended the curse. I don't say ended the curse, but uh, they swept uh, the Capitals, which probably should have happened regardless. But them being the President's Trophy winner, uh, you never know what's going to happen there. So they looked impressive as well as the Hurricanes. But I'm all for this matchup here. And I know, David, you probably are as well as a hockey fan. But Hurricanes and Rangers, I want to talk more about that uh, and kind of give a preview to how you see this series going down. So, David, how do you see that series going down? I think it's going to be a slugfest. Um, Ultimately, I think the Canes are going to win, and I think they're going to uh, win it in uh, six games. But the way that I'm envisioning the uh, six-game series going is – Basically, in in game six, it's an overtime, and it looks like we're going to get a game seven. And then the Hurricanes score the uh, overtime winning goal to a win it in six. But these are two juggernauts. These are these were two of the best teams in, in the regular season, and certainly they've been showing up in the playoffs so far. Um, now the question about the Hurricanes is, can they can they finally win a, a, a conference championship this time, like or at least for the first time in a while? Because they have been one of the best teams in the NHL for the past three, four, or five, five years, but they just have not gotten – they've not been able to get over the hump. I mean, we saw what happened last year when they got swept by the Florida Panthers. And I actually picked the Hurricanes to uh, at least win the Eastern Conference last year, and they got they totally got punked by Florida. Um, and uh, and then if I recall correctly, I think, I, think, I think Florida and Carolina are able to meet in the uh, – in the uh, in the in the conference finals, um, and we could end up seeing that again. And if that does happen, I mean, hopefully we don't see a sweep because we like to uh, as as neutral fans, we want to see a competitive series. So yeah, but, uh, yeah, I'll be excited to see what happens either way. Just as long as uh, Florida lose, just as long as the Panthers lose. See, I can't. I gotta try hard not to say Florida because I know some punk is going to clip that and they're gonna be like, "Oh, look what David said about his uh, football team." But he meant to say Florida State, okay? Um, but <laughs> yes, we, we will have a chance to see that because the East right now is is kind of where it's at. Because let's say Boston does win, they will face off against Florida, which right there is a great matchup. And then, as we just talked about, Hurricanes and uh, the Rangers is also going to be a really fun matchup to watch. Uh, two years ago, if I remember correctly, the Canes and Rangers did meet, and I, and the Canes did win that series, if I remember correctly. So, But there are some new faces to see on the Canes team, such as Kuznetsov, who we just talked about last night. Uh, but I'm all for this series, uh, and I'm all for that I mean, Minnesota Timberwolves and Denver Nuggets series. Uh, I, I'm popping my popcorn. I'm getting ready because it's going to be that type of matchup for both of those uh, series. So stay tuned to those, and we're going to talk more about them as they come. But I want to transition really quick to uh, growing up, I hated school. Uh, I wasn't a straight-A student. Uh, in fact, you know, there were several times I got A's. There were several times I got F's. Well, now the tables have turned, and I'm the one handing out the grades, and my other two gentlemen here as well will be handing out the grades as we talk about the MLB so far in this first semester. I'll talk about at who gets an A, who gets an F. We're not talking in between. We're talking A's. We're talking F's. And Ed, go ahead and start with your A's and F's so far. So far, <clears throat> I am going to – put a dunce cap and send off into the corner with an F grade and a suspension at this point for my Houston Astros. It has just been horrific watching this team after all the expectations that we've had going into this season. We've had so many injuries on the pitching staff. Our bullpen has just been absolutely atrocious and it's not like we're scoring enough runs to keep up with what we're giving up. We're already minus 21 in run differential, and that's with an explosive offense, let alone if we were actually trying to just move runners and do the little things. This is an offense that is designed to score in bunches, and they're doing that part. They're just not able to keep up with what the pitching staff is giving up at this point. Now, I will say I did see that uh, Abreu has accepted 
being sent down for development. And I'm happy to see that happen. I just want to know who's playing first base. I want to know who's going to be there and staying there so we can help get this part of it back on track because he was really a weak link in the, in the lineup. But in the end, it has been that pitching staff that has not lived up to the billing. Now, overall, Houston still has a chance to get into the playoffs because we're still only the first month in a, you know, 767 game season. So they've got time, but they can't, they can't let the Mariners get too far ahead of them uh, before they turn this around. And so they get an F for me right now. And maybe I'm being overly critical because it's my team, but I don't think so. They've had, they were supposed to be up here. They are way down here, way below where you can see my hand in the camera. <laughs> it's, it's been that bad. As far as an A, I'm going to give it to the Cleveland Guardians. They have been just tearing through teams. And really, the AL Central has been really good, except for that one team that is just atrocious. But the Cleveland Guardians, they have been good on offense. They've been good on defense. They've been good on pitching. It's been a solid all-around effort. There hasn't been any anybody that I've seen just majorly stick out more than anybody else, but it's a collective effort. Now, I'm also going to give honorable mention to the Kansas City Royals. Same number of wins uh, going into today, uh, just but they've also played a couple more games, so they're kind of neck and neck. It's just been fun to see the AL Central be good. You know, so many years you see the you know the AL and the NL Central just be the also ran teams. Well, here they're shining at this point. But before I talk about my my teams, Ed, let me ask you this: with the uh, with the way that your Astros have been performing so far, and mm-hmm. then you know with Dusty Baker recently uh, retiring, mm-hmm. do you think that this is get like? Do you think Dusty is now getting more respect because you know, as we all know. Uh, Dusty Baker overall was a very good manager, but he also had a lot of naysayers. And I think even when he won a World Series with you guys, there were still people who were saying, well, of course he finally wins it with the most loaded team in baseball. <laughs> so, so yeah, he's always going to have guys like that. But still, seeing how you guys are performing uh, so, so far, do you think now Dusty Baker is going to get the respect that, it, that he deserves, that he's going to get more respect now? He's already one of the most well-respected managers in baseball, period. He's just retiring. He, he just retired. So he's been doing it for a very long time with a lot of legacy and super respected all around the league. Now, as far as the fan bases, I'm honest, I didn't like Dusty Baker as a manager. I thought there were games that I saw him lose as with the moves that he made more – more so in big spots than games that he won with moves that he made. But what we're seeing now is in the regular season, Dusty Baker is a hell of a manager and he could manage a day to day situation more to me, more so than the, the pressure, the pressure pack playoff system where every pitch is your last. And that's, to your point, yes, we're. I think people that didn't necessarily like Dusty Baker, like myself, are missing him because uh, because we now know what he meant as far as the moves that he would make, given the circumstances of what they're looking at right now. Because the Astros dealt with injuries the past couple of seasons as well, but this year it has just come back to bite us so hard. And I think that's a testament to the manager. Yeah. 
You just didn't like the toothpick that he constantly had in his mouth. <laughs> I want to know if it was cinnamon or yeah. what kind of flavor was on that thing. There, there's probably some tobacco, some type of flavor on there. I, it, it's 2020. Bubba, bubba. It's 2024. So it was it was an extremely skinny cigar. That's what that was. It was, it was a vape. You just couldn't see it. But uh, uh, David, I'll go ahead and let you take the floor on your A's and F's. All right. Um, I'll also start off with my uh, with my F's. Um, I think I, I, Ed. I think you pretty much kind of took the same approach here. But for me, um, the way that I give out an F is if you had decent or high expectations and you've absolutely failed to l- live up to them. I mean, it's one thing if you were expected to suck and, and, and you're sucking. So you're like, yeah, you know, the White Sox get an F, but I don't think they had high expectations. I'm same talking about <laughs> exactly. But I'm talking about teams that had decent expectations and they've just totally failed to live up live up to them. The Astros are one of, one of those teams, but Ed already uh, talked about them. So I'm going to talk about my team. And that is the Tampa Bay Rays. I mean, last year we raced off to a uh, 13-0 start, which tied the uh, record for the best start ever by, uh, by a major league team. And this year we're not doing too hot. We're, uh, we're in last place in the AL East. I – I'm pretty sure we have by far the worst run differential in that division. And then recently we, we lost a series to the white white Sox. Not only that, I think we got swept. We got swept by the worst team in, in baseball. I mean, it's harder to hit rock bottom than, than, than that. So, uh, but it is still a long season and I think we certainly have the, the players who can turn it around, but man, Things have not been pretty in St. Pete so far, guys. And then as far as uh, an A goes, listen, there's uh, there's quite a few teams that deserve an A, um, but the ones I'll give an A to are the Orioles, the Yankees, the Braves, and uh, and the Phillies. I think those teams have uh, stepped their games up, and especially give credit to the the Yankees, um, who their offense has looked fantastic after it looked after it looked like crap last year. Yeah, uh, I mean, the Yankees were going to be my A uh, as well just because of them being overhyped, but I'm going to take a different direction there. But I want to start with my uh, F, and this was not orchestrated whatsoever, but all three of our Fs happen to be our own personal teams. Maybe that's because we are paying attention to them more. We're more critical of them, not delusional, but critical. And uh, for me, that's obvious. It's going to be the San Francisco Giants. They don't have the worst record in the NL West. Uh, They're right in the middle. But this is more than just this regular season. This started even beforehand when it came to free agency. The Giants struggled to land any top, really, uh, free agent uh, as they, of course, went after Otani, uh, you know, amongst others. And they did end up with Solaire, and they ended up with Blake Snell. Well, Blake Snell is now on the IL. And the Giants are really just struggling to really get a groove. And when it feels like they are getting one uh, and close to getting a 500 record, they decide to really just, oh, let's not play again. Uh, Blake Snell being the reigning def- uh Cy Young winner, and then also Logan Webb, our starting pitcher, who was number two on the voting of Cy Young. You would have thought this was going to be such a pitching team. Nope, you're wrong. Uh, it's our bullpen is horrible. They continue to put in uh, is it Tyler Rogers? I believe it's Tyler Rogers who just can't, he's the submarine pitcher who just seems like everyone knows how to hit off him now, but we continue to just throw him in there and he continues to get destroyed. And it's like, all right, well, we really need to figure something out here. Uh, I know it's Bob Melvin's first season there, uh, but I'm just really critical of really the directions of where the giants are headed because they did want to be aggressive in this free agency. And they ended up with Solaire and they ended up with, Blake Snell, who, in my opinion, are both underperforming. So for me, I, I think the expectation was a little bit higher. If you want to compete with the Dodgers, you're going to have to do a whole lot hell better than what you're doing now. And if you continue this trend, you're just going to be at the middle or the bottom of the pack for years to come. So there my F. Before you get to your A-team, Matthew, since we are talking about the, the Giants, I am – I am curious to know because we all remember a few years ago when they won had 107 games, just, you know, 
totally came, totally came out of nowhere. They were the surprise of the season, and they won 107 games. But correct me if I'm mistaken, but wasn't that more so because a bunch of guys on that roster had career years all, all at the same time? Yeah, Logan Webb was phenomenal. He's our, our number one pitcher, uh, and he did phenomenal even in the postseason also. But Buster Posey, it was his, his uh, you know last year, and he really just – uh, balled out that year. It had nothing to do with Gabe Kapler. I want to repeat that. It had nothing to do with Gabe Kapler. Horrible manager. But the Giants, it was kind of uh, an anomaly because uh, the Giants weren't expected to really do that, and you could call it luck. And I'll say that even about my own team, that it was it was kind of luck that we were able to do that. But uh, we put up a good fight in the five-game series against the Dodgers, uh, who had the second-best record in the MLB, but they were the wild-card team. It's yeah. Like that works out. But – they were the better team that year, and they continue to be the better team uh, even after. So, so y'all won 107 games in spite of Kapler, not because of him. Yes, but that's kind of tough because then you win those. Of course, you're going to keep him. Uh, eventually, they they we didn't, but uh, mm-hmm. the next year it was all oh, this guy is great. No, no, he's not. <laughs> so it's kind of tough. Do you win and make him look good, or do you lose? You never really want to lose and just throw games. So that's kind of how I felt about it. But it was it was a great year that we had. It was it was awesome to see us do that. But it was kind of an anomaly. But. Uh, I want to switch over to my A, and yes, I kind of am changing some directions here, but my A is not nearly, not necessarily a team, but it's a player, and that's Mookie Betts. I, I even hate doing this as a Giants fan, but Mookie Betts is right now the face of baseball. This guy went from a, being a gold glove right fielder to now a shortstop, hasn't skipped a beat, and is by far probably the best offensive player in baseball right now. I don't think you could be as complete as Mookie Betts is right now. Uh, Yes, the Dodgers are in first place, but this isn't really them that I want to talk about. It's more of Mookie Betts. Uh, Everyone wanted to talk about the Shohei being on the team uh, and talk about all the other players in Major League Baseball. But let's not forget what Mookie Betts has done in his career and what he's doing now and even at a better rate. Mookie Betts is by no means old. He is still in his prime, and I just think he's the best player in baseball. I could have easily probably gave this to the Yankees because the Yankees being one of the, usually the most overrated teams, they are actually uh, excelling this year to even overcoming injuries with their starting pitcher. But the Dodgers uh, and Mookie Betts, I just I can't uh, let that go unnoticed. I think that Mookie Betts, is, what he's doing is, is quite legendary, and I think that he'll be on his way to another MVP now in the NL. So uh, that's going to be my A right there. Of course, yes, the uh, Phillies – are on the up and coming and even the Braves with the injuries they're facing, uh, continuing to be on the top of their game. So you could give it to the AL and the NL East, <laughs> like David was saying with those teams, but I'm going to go ahead and give it to Mookie Betts. Well, you know, uh, before we, uh, before we end the show, I also want to, uh, give a huge shout out. And honestly, I think we need to give an A grade to the Oakland athletics. Yes, they are 15 and 17, but when you're considering the circumstances they're dealing with, the, the distractions of them moving to Sacramento and then eventually to Las Vegas, the fact that they're 15 and 17 is miraculous. Like that they're 15 and 17 and not like, uh, you know, four and 28 or, or whatever. So shout out to those guys for still being somewhat competitive, even with all the shit that they're dealing with right now. I think Seven. there's more people on this show than are in their stands. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right uh, yeah i mean it could change but i'm not saying drastically maybe double <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh that's probably their peak right there but their bullpen their bullpen's legit uh watching what their bullpen has been able to do actually the last several games from uh scoreless innings is impressive and that's really what's helping them uh stay in these games let alone win these games so you know big shout out to their bullpen and the a's uh, right now because of what they're having to deal with and also what they're doing. So they could easily be the Chicago White Sox right now, but they aren't. So, uh, you know, kudos to them. Um, And one player, if I could give an A grade to uh, beyond Mookie Betts is Juan Soto. I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) He has, Aaron Judge has not been 
really just lighting it up since the start of this season. You know, he's he's going to have to get heated up and get going. Juan Soto has been carrying a lot of that offense, and it's been a good offense. Don't get me wrong. But at this point, his acquisition in New York has been just an A-plus grade hitting in front of Judge because even though Judge has been struggling, nobody wants to pitch to him. So guess what? Juan Soto gets things to hit. And lo and behold, he is killing it right now. Yeah, he is. And I know I kind of change things up by having a player as my A, but uh, I, there, if there's a player that I want to give an F to, it seems like it, you could probably say this guy every year, and that's Anthony Rendon. Anthony Rendon has <laughs> now gone down once again with an injury. And I think I saw the other day, since he signed his contract, what, three years ago, he's only played a total of 53 games. And keep in mind, there's 162 in a season. So, uh Good for him. <laughs> I mean, making that money on the injured reserve. So, but uh, it's just what a letdown he was for uh, you know the city of LA or more. So the Angels. All right. Well, if we're all giving shout outs to players, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be left out. I'll make this very <laughs> quick, okay? But shout out to Wyatt Langford for recently hitting his first home run, and his first home run was an inside the park home run. So hell of a way to start off your home runs, right? Yeah, you leave your mark. Absolutely. And if they could just do it in better uniforms, all that (laughs) baby blue is just, it's atrocious to the eyeballs. Yeah, it's it's definitely an an eye poker, but uh, but yeah, there, there's there's a lot of A's, there's a lot of F's to hand out as we've pretty much established here. Uh, we could probably go on and on more about it, but I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say uh, for your A's and F's so far this year in the MLB. Uh, the season is still young, like Ed said, it's only been about one month. So a drop in the comments, uh, your A's, your F's, if you want to hand out grades. Also drop in the comments your predictions on how you see the rest of the NBA and the rest of the NHL playoffs, uh, more specifically this first round of playoffs, uh, how it's going to end up, because I'll be interested to hear there, guys. But we appreciate you guys stopping by. Continue to hit that like, that subscribe button, share these videos, and always let us know how you guys feel. Uh, Your opinions matter to us, so uh, we hope to give you guys the best content that we can as well. But until next time, guys, we are rounding third, and we are headed for home.